In the ancient world, what they would do is these women, 12 months of beauty treatments. Just follow me here for a moment. What they would do is the women would come and they would get in their rooms, if you will, and they would go into these beauty treatments. And one element of the beauty treatments, besides just the perfumery, one element was they would have these dual burning uh, burners, if you will, and they would place coals on the burners and when the burners were ready, they would place incense on the coals. And the incense would then rise up. And what they would do in the ancient world is they would actually, the women would get over the burners, oftentimes naked, or if you're in the south, naked, okay? And uh, uh, guys, don't let your mind wander there. Just come on back, guys. Come on back. Come on back. <laughs> They would, they would crouch over the burning incense. They would put a tent, no joke, they would put a tent over them. So what they did, and they would have these treatments, and what they would do is they would, they would create, if you will, an incense sauna. And a couple things happened. One is they believed that the, this, this beauty treatment would actually um, remove the contaminants and the toxins that were in their body. You know, we get into some of this today too. Every, you know, some of you are into that. And, and, they would re, and they, so they believe that this process actually removed the toxins and the contaminants. And secondly, after you do that day after day after day, you, you start to ooze with fragrance. Let me show you something. This tradition kind of starts to find its way into the church with the power of incense. We're about to go high church up in here today. <laughs> How many of you have ever been in the, um, in the Catholic church? A lot of you. We talked about Mary last week. Let's talk about some other good stuff this week. Here's a coal, charcoal. Y'all say, help him, Lord. I'm not a high church kind of person. I've only done this a couple times before. One in the first service, and I burnt the you-know-what out of my hand. <laughs> you aren't supposed to laugh at that. There's one coal. Here's the second coal. So they had these burners, and they would light these coals. And there's a period of time that the coals just need... Oh, that's lovely. Just need to... Simmer, if you will. And once these coals simmered, they would place the incense on the coals. And the women believed, the Persian culture taught, that it was a process of cleansing you. Removing from your body contaminants. Now here's the connection, beloved. Here is the deal. In the Bible, there is a process, there is a preparation that I quite frankly believe that the church has kind of forgotten. Not the whole church, but I believe there are people in the church, in the Western world particularly, where we have turned Christianity into a consumeristic religion, where it's all about what I get out of it. We start to fall in love with the place instead of the face behind the place, Jesus Christ, and we start to live our Christianity, and it's really all about what I can get from God as opposed to my relationship with God and the practice that we have forgotten. That is the process by which we, 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 we spell out, if you will, the contaminants of sin. The toxins of sin is a process that the Bible calls confession and repentance. Confession and repentance. And if you want to know the very first thing I would say to you about preparation to be ready when the divine opportunity comes your way, the process, the first thing I want to say to you about preparation is that it comes, listen church, through regular, dare I say daily, confession of sin and repentance of sin. Amen. And we as Christians in the 21st century, listen, we have forgotten that. Have we forgotten, just think, have we forgotten that God is holy? 
And I know we don't understand that fully because we're not, and so it's hard to understand. But listen, God is holy. And the Bible says that I'm supposed to be ye holy as God is holy. So therefore, there's this reality in my life that God is holy and I am sinful. And the only way in which I stay in a right relationship with God, listen, church, listen, is that by regularly coming to God and confessing my sin and repenting of my sin. Have we forgotten? Have we forgotten that sin fractures, breaks my relationship with God? See, we, we come to Christ. And so many, this is important for those of you who've walked with Christ for a long time. You've been believers your whole life. Listen, it's a slow fade. It's a subtle slip whereby you start to forget that God is holy. And listen, you start to forget that sin, my sin, offends the heart of God. I mean, my sin is repulsive to God. And we forget it. And for those of you who are new believers... If you're not careful, and if I don't do a good job of teaching you, you'll start to think that, you know, salvation is just coming to Jesus and accepting what he did on the cross. He died on the cross. He shed his blood for you. He forgives you of your sin. All of that is true. But if we're not careful, we can start to believe that is a one-time reality. And we forget that part of what it means to grow in Christianity is to actually live in such an intimate relationship with God. Number one, when I sin, it breaks my heart. Like, do you care anymore? Like, like seriously, when you sin, and if you're anything like me, beloved, it, it wasn't too long ago, right? When you fall short of the glory of God, be it just in your speech or your attitude or your eyes or your mind or your vocation or your cheating or your finances, when you sin, I'm asking the question seriously, does it bother you anymore? Like, there was a song in the 80s. I know I'm showing my age, old school here, baby. But there was a song by Ray Bolts. You remember it? Do you still feel the nails? You remember that? Do you still feel the nails, God? Every time I fail? I, I don't know, but I, I think he does. And I, th I think we've forgotten that when Benji falls short of the glory of God... It offends God. And because he's holy, listen, because he's holy, my sin and his holiness cannot coexist. And therefore, the only way in which I get the relationship back to a good place, the only way in which I restore the relationship is by confession of my sin and repentance. It's why the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and what? And what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, we have forgotten this incredibly important process. Confession and repentance is key, church. Go to Psalm 51. While you're, telling there, let me, while you're going there, let me tell you a little bit about this guy. Um, his name is David. Some of you grew up in the church, you know about David, right? So David is out on his, you know, palace, patio one day, if you will, and he looks across the way and he sees a woman out on her deck. And her name is Bathsheba. And uh, kind of like Esther would say, you know, she was easy on the eyes, right? So David looks out and there she is, and he, he falls in his mind first. Guys, never make a mistake about this. You fall in your mind first. He falls in his mind first, and then he summons Bathsheba. And Bathsheba comes over, and, you know, the rest, unfortunately, is history. They have sex. She's married. She shows up pregnant. He hears that she's pregnant, and then he does the, he, you know, he compounds sin with sin. I mean, this is, guys, this is, this is TMZ kind of stuff right here. He, 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 then, he then calls for her husband by the name of Uriah. And Uriah comes and he gets, you know, has a little too much to drink with Uriah that night. And then the next day, he tells his officials when they go into battle, put Uriah on the front lines so that Uriah can die. And that is exactly what happens. I mean, this guy just, this is David. This is David who found favor with God. 
Some of you are here today and you're like, I like this favor series, but I don't think I can ever find favor because of what I've done. That's why I'm teaching you this. It's not about what you have done, beloved. It is about what you do. It's not even about what you do tomorrow if that is sin. It is about you learning to let that sin break your heart. Like it breaks the heart of God. And it is about you then cultivating the discipline, the holy habit of confessing that sin, repenting of that sin, which means what? Repent means to turn from. It's 180. When I realize I've sinned, it breaks my heart because it breaks the heart of God. I find my place. I get on my knees. I pray that God would forgive me. And I turn from that sin. And I walk in a completely different direction. That's what repentance means. And when I do that, I become the candidate for God's favor. And what we find in Psalm 51, maybe you're there. Psalm 51, we find David is in this place of contrition. He's in this place of brokenness. He's in this place of humility. And look at what the Bible says in Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God. Say that with me. Have mercy on me, O God. Let's continue. According to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Go to verse 2 with me. Ready? Go. Wash all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Watch this, verse 5. Surely I was sinful at birth. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Let's go to verse 10. Let's keep that slide up there. Going to the next one. Verse 10. It says, create in me. You did so good. Let's read it. Ready? Go, church. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. David, who could probably trump most of us in here in our sin category, right? Any of you, you know, committed adultery, you know, got the woman pregnant and then killed the husband? If you did... We'd like to meet with you after the service. <laughs> seriously. To talk, to pray, to love. Seriously, seriously. Um, but then you see David who, who's broken before God. Humbled. Contrite. Have you forgotten this? I have at times. Have you forgotten that when you sin, it doesn't matter how big or how small, it's offensive to God? Have we forgotten that what it means to love God with all of our heart and all of our mind and all of our soul and all of our strength means to actually live in such an intimate relationship with God that our heart stays tender before God so that when I fall short of God's glory, it, 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 it awakens me, it disturbs me, it interferes with me, and that I know, therefore, that my relationship is not right with God, and the only way that I'm going to get it back right with God is I actually come before God, and with all humility and all transparency, He knows anyway, and all brokenness, I confess And I not only confess, but I turn from that particular sin. And some of you are here because you want favor. Amen? But some of you are also here and you continue to struggle with the same sin over and over and over. And some of you are here today. And again, I'm not throwing stones. I've been there. You're here today. And the truth is, you've kind of grown hard-hearted. You don't even confess anymore. You aren't going to receive favor, beloved. Preparation for finding favor, point number one today under this preparation thing. Preparation for finding favor is to develop a daily rhythm of regular confession and repentance. Daily. 
And if you're anything like me, sometimes, guys, it's more than daily, you know? Sometimes, sometimes I'm laying my head down on my pillow at night, and I'm praying this prayer. I'm saying, God, I'm sure that I've sinned today in ways that I'm not even fully aware. You know? I, God, there's something, probably a thought, something I said in passing that I'm not even aware of it, God. I am sorry. Will you forgive me? Guys, the sin fractures and breaks the relationship with God. We develop this daily rhythm. Secondly, the second point under this preparation is that preparation involves sharpening your skills. Like, like if you're a beautician or you're a car salesman or you're a CEO or you're a stay-at-home mom, stay-at-home dad, or you're a school teacher, principal, or a pastor. I've got some pastors in here today. doesn't matter what you do. Part of the preparation process is that you actually are constantly trying to get better at your trade. And can I just tell you something? Can I just meddle for a moment? I believe we as a country, I'm just talking about the country. I believe we as a country have grown and are growing more and more afraid of hard work. We, we, guys, what, what made this country great was, yes, its ingenuity, was, yes, the, the, the educational system, was, yes, this, was, yes, that. But what made our country great is that it was consisted of men and women who were not afraid to work their butts off to become great. And I'm telling you, with America, and I'm not going to meddle in this area alone because this is not a political speech, but America is losing its place in the world because we've become a bunch of slackers, a bunch of lazy people. Now, I'm not saying everybody. You might be the hardest working man or woman in, in this area. Praise God for you. But listen, we are becoming lazy as a culture, as a people. And what the Bible teaches in Esther, this prepper, it was long. It was tedious. And what you see when you look at the scriptures is that, guys, preparation involves work. Preparation involves getting better. This is why we take our team, our pastors and stuff, to conferences. We're all about learning. We constantly want to get better and better and better at what we do. And regardless of what you do for a living, listen, you ought to try to get better. You should never be happy with where you are. Part of the preparation process is not only confession and repentance, but it's that I'm going to do everything I can do to be the best at what I'm called to do. Martin Luther King Jr., I love him. Martin Luther King Jr. said, and I'm not going to get the quote exactly right, but he basically said, whatever you do, even if you are a street sweeper, sweep that street to the glory of God. Cassius Clay. Y'all know who Cassius Clay is? Muhammad Ali. I love that dude. Muhammad Ali said this. I love this quote. I run on the road, baby, long before I dance under the lights. Come on now. Come on now. That's hard work. Hard work is what gets us into this position so that God looks down on me and God says, there's a clean person. There's a person who is living before me with righteousness and holiness no they're not perfect but when they sin they confess it there is a person who is upright with integrity and there is a person who is working putting his mind to work his heart to work his life to work to become the best person he can be whatever he or she is doing that's a candidate for my favor 